The scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I would guess these are familiar verses to most of us. Reading from chapter 15. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in the desert to feed so great a crowd? Jesus asked them, How many loaves have you? They said, Seven, and a few small fish. Then, ordering the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all of them ate and were filled, and they took up the, gro the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Those who had eaten were 4,000 men besides women and children. After sending them away, the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadha. The word of God for the people of God. Oh, Sam, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And welcome to those who are online watching this service from wherever you might be. And for the next several weeks, we've been doing this for the last couple weeks, until the end of August, I'm going to be lifting up scripture and my Friday in the e-news letter to the saints all about growing the beloved community, our new vision here in this church. What might it look like? Who's involved? How can we do it? How can we bring it about into this world, into this place? That's what I'm talking about. They're all ideas. If something catches your attention or your soul, your heart, then lift it up and talk about it. Maybe that's what we'll do in, in the coming months about growing the beloved community. Now, this story is the only story that's in all four Gospels the feeding of the multitudes. Sometimes it's 5,000, sometimes it's 4,000, sometimes it's 5,000, and then they say, plus women and children. You know, they do all those things. As Andrew said, one time in John version, a, a little boy opens up people's hearts and with his sharing, open up everyone else's sharing. That's a story from John. There's similarities throughout, but there's also many differences as well. Why is it that Matthew and Mark tell this story twice with little variations? One is 5,000, one is 4,000. Maybe scholars say the 4,000 is for the Gentile audience, the five is for the Jewish audience. But we're all one audience, we're all one congregation, we're all one people listening to these stories. So let's figure out what this story might tell us today, one of the six. So let us do so with a prayer, let us pray. Gracious God, holy God, beloved God, you bring us news of your love every morning and bring that news to us this very morning. Open our eyes and our seeing our ears and our hearing, our lives and our living. This day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three days with Jesus. This is the only one of the six stories that has three days with Jesus. All the rest, it was evening, evening was coming or whatever it was, it was one day and they all went off and back home at some point. But can you imagine spending three days with Jesus? I was trying to imagine what it must have looked like for that crowd here in Matthew 15. What they did those three days. They must have eaten, right? And only until this story comes around do we hear that the food had all run out. I'm thinking maybe a few of them were Presbyterians. 
you know, out of 4,000 or so plus women and children or 5,000. And so I thought maybe a few of those days they were spent in committee meetings, which I thought was a good way to spend three days with Jesus. I thought maybe that might work. Or I'm sure there are a lot of hymns being sung, stories being told, people taking care of the kids. They're all running around. You've been in places like that. It's a marvelous scene. Three days with Jesus. But if you were to know that culture back then, three days is a long time. You couldn't be out of work for that many days for most of the population. You wouldn't have any food. And they were so inundated with the culture around them that those three days may have been a respite from empire. They lived empire their entire life. You know, the Roman Empire, but there were six other empires before the Roman Empire. Their tradition was to be always lorded over by people, by the powerful, and they had nothing. That was their life. They couldn't breathe. And so for three days, they could breathe with Jesus. Some of them lived probably in Greek areas, and the Greeks had their own way of looking at life, and a lot of it was looking at statues and beauty and big thoughts and so forth. They didn't have time for big thoughts or beauty. That wasn't their life. And there was the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees? What if they were trying to get away from the Pharisees where for three days at least, where the Pharisees had 365 laws. A lot were no's, many yeses. You imagine living by laws all the time, that if you follow the laws the Pharisees said, that you could then find that life that God wants you to have. Follow laws. Oh, oh my goodness. Remember the Iscari, Judas of Iscariot? with all the issues going on with the empire and so forth, and, and there's a lot of dissension and violence and so forth, well, the Iscariot people, Iscari, they had swords, they had knives, and they would go about their days killing others because of the empire, of trying to rid themselves of all that was oppressing them, the violent group right there. What about the Essenes? Maybe some of these people had heard about the Essenes. Ever heard, anyone hear about the Essenes? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. And, and Al Alvin. Essenes were those who wanted to get away from it all. All the violence, all the laws, all the empire, and they went off into the wilderness, into some other place. Anyone ever feel they want to do that? Go off someplace and not have to worry about our culture, our society for a while? They did that. They removed themselves over here someplace. Oh, and they were still, there were still the priests. And they always wanted you to sacrifice a lamb if you had money, a dove if you didn't. But always that sacrifice for forgiveness of sins. You see, the people that gathered there in that space, looking at Jesus for three days, had all those pressures on them the pressures of living. And I dare say we probably have some of the same pressures today. Why in the world would we find ourselves three days listening to Jesus? I would have thought Jesus would have stood up there in this story and said, okay, you know what it's like out there, people. I'm different. And I'm going to tell you just follow my rules. I'm going to hand out a pamphlet, if you forget, or, I, or some paper with a pen, and you can write down what you should do to follow me. That's what we do a lot. You know, we have people that, that are kind of the sages in the world, and they tell you what you need to know. Or I thought maybe Jesus would say, toughen up, everybody. I've given you three days. Time to move back in the world. That's okay, you can do it. A little strength here like we do on Sunday mornings, go out after we've been here for an hour, sing, pray, listen, talk. We can go out in the world maybe with something more. Didn't do that one either. You know what he did? 
it shows up in four of the six stories of the feeding of the multitudes. Four of the six. It says, Jesus had compassion on the crowds. Jesus had compassion on the crowds. I dare say all the other ideologies out there pressing on these people, none of them had compassion on the crowds. None. Compassion. You know what it means, right? It means to suffer with. That's the definition of compassion, to suffer with. Jesus was saying, I have a suffering with attitude toward all of you. I will suffer with you as you go about your days. I will suffer with you with all the violence in the world. I will suffer with you with all the need in the world. I will suffer with you with all of the despair in the world. I will be there with you, suffering with you. I can't think of any better way to have a beloved community and grow one as to have that word compassion front and center. Everything we do, wouldn't it be amazing if we had compassion for the person we were having trouble with? Or the person we don't agree with? Or the person that just gets on our nerves? Let alone how much fun it might be if we actually treated each other, our friends, with compassion. Maybe this is the word we want to hold on to. It's a great word. You've already had it in your life already. But what if we were to use it more and more? And what if we were to see compassion that combines with the great vision? And here it is, everybody. The beloved community is also the great banquet. We are experiencing it right now. We don't have lunch afterward because we're experiencing the great banquet right now. You've already been part of it all. The table is always before us. We've already received the bread and, and the cup. And so to experience the great banquet, let's keep an image like that. Have you thought we are going to do three days with Jesus? Imagine spending three days with Jesus. So Monday, Tuesday. Okay, so you have to, you have to Wednesday to spend three days with Jesus. See what happens by Wednesday. One last thing. I'm still a little irritated that the stories only say like 5,000 men. And then maybe... They think, well, I should probably add children and women with that, right? You know, as an afterthought, Matthew did that. The other ones just kind of went right for the men. Well, stay tuned until next Sunday. Do I have a scripture for you? And we're giving you a little teaser with this scripture, because the last thing you read in this scripture is that Jesus doesn't go off by himself alone somewhere on a mountaintop or in a boat onto the sea like he often does. In this story, you know what Jesus does? He goes to Magdala. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Magdala? Why would it? Because there's a woman named Mary that came from there. Mary Magdalene. And for centuries, they have tried to keep her down. For centuries, there were stories floating around that she was a prostitute or some other kind of ne'er-do-well. For centuries, people were trying to push her off to the side. But there's new scholarship about Mary Magdalene that just came out. And I will share that with you next week.
Because this may help us understand that Christianity is not 4,000 men and a few women and children, but that Christianity is about 4,000 women and men and others, and, but 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, we're all together in this the great banquet. You see this thing that's been off kilter the entire sermon. You see all the different faces. This is the great banquet, everybody. I can't wait to be part of this more and more as we move on into this world. Thank you for sharing that world with me. Oh, thanks be to God. Amen.